definitely steps that you must take here in Kenya before you can actually own your first car. And it is essential that you note these things down because without them, you certainly will be in a little bit of trouble, especially if you're a first time owner. Take a look at funny man Gasha, who will take us through some of the steps and the experts will come on to expand on that. Hi, I'm Gasha. Now, I'm here to tell you what not to do when you want to buy a car. If that guy's name starts with John Clone, there's something, he's Congolese, he's going to help with your color. Forget about it. If he's from Nigeria, forget about it. What am I trying to say? Research, research, research. Do not cut any corners. Because if you cut corners, it will deprive you of the opportunity to ride in a beauty, a beauty like this. So stay tuned and I will keep you abreast with what to do and what not to do. Good evening, sir. How are you, Welcome sir? Welcome to Gamax. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you looking for? Looking. Let me tell you about my experience. I just made this serious deal and I had so much, so much chum. So this is what I did. Number one, I never buy a car because of the mileage. This is my theory. In the UK, if a car has done 100,000 kilometers, that's 100,000 kilometers of good road and good service history. So at least I know that car is good. Number two, never buy a car from a non-licensed car dealer. It's like going to catch points in an off-license uh, Kiovis. You're going to go get uh, drink the formaldehyde, then the next thing, oh, Mzima Cha, Mzima Cha, I can't see nothing. That's your fault. Number three, always always do a research on that car with now with here in kenya we have the kenya revenue authority do a search all right do a search of the logbook find out who was the previous owner all right and once you've done that and you've verified that then you know your car is clean yeah this is what i want and i'm a checkbook all right <laughs> yeah okay. so choose what you like and i'll give it to you so this is the joy of owning a car is good but the grief of losing one is equally bad I'll tell you this, this for a fact. The Thunges, the car jackers, these guys want to come and take what's yours. Now, insure your car. Get the insurance, insure your car. Make sure you put some cautionary devices in your car, like a car truck or an alarm. So at least if your car, right now, we have, we have companies that are able to retrieve cars with their, with their devices. Number three. If you take a shortcut on your car, you never know whether your car is stolen. And that is why you need to do research, research, research. Because you could end up buying a car, probably the number plates have been put on the car by thieves. Most buyers right now are buying small cars, master than use. You buy the Honda Fit. You buy is it because of, it because of uh, the banks? And the banks, yeah. Because people have to pay loan. small loans quickly. Small loans quickly. quickly. I'm no guru when it comes to machines and engines and stuff, but at least I know my ABC about an engine. Like uh, here, I know this car has an alternator, it has a starter, and it has an air cleaner. Plus, it also has a chassis number. But I can bet you, and I'm speaking to the ladies, let me tell you, uh, you should not be about just entering a car and moving it from point A to B. Get involved. Did you know the chassis number sometimes is on the hub? Did you know the chase's number sometimes is on the engine block? Did you even know that your chase's number is on the steering wheel? Did you know your chase's number is on the number plate? Did you know the chase's number is on the battery? Now you see, I could be lying to you and you don't know that. But I'll tell you three places where definitely your chase's number is. Number one, engine block. Number two, safety belt. Number three, is a hub. I'll tell you something else you didn't know about a car. Ladies, there's some numbers on the, on the bottom of a window. The last number is usually a digit, four or five or six. That's the make of your car. I know you didn't know that. But anyway, stay tuned and I'll teach you ladies more about this. Uh, I, 
Okay, I don't know much about it, but this engine, this cars, yeah, this cars. Yeah. So much cash, so much cash. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a point where you exchange the check for the car keys. Hey, but wait, wait, one minute, one minute, one minute. One minute. Before you do that, make sure that you have research, research, and research. Now you see, like now me, my research is that this car will come with this beautiful lady. So I'm going with her with the car as take the check. No. That is funny man Gasha who is a car enthusiast and took us through step by step of what you should note before you bu first buy your car. Okay, I'm now joined by experts in the auto world, Mr. Gilbert Miner Obondi and Mike Moy. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank it's you. good to have you. you here. Yes. Yeah, I think Gasha must have derailed a few people. That car does not come <laughs> with a fine lady, does it? <laughs> it would be nice if it did, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's get to the nitty-gritty of the matter. Buying your first car is very essential, obviously. Mike, we'll start with you. When did your love for the auto world and cars actually begin and where has it taken you thus far? It started in school when I was in my math lessons. I didn't like math, so instead of doing math, I was drawing cars. And then my design career got me into the media and I went for a launch and I wrote a caption. And it, that's where it started. Now you write, now I write about cars. Yes. So I you do. love it, don't you? It's my passion. Excellent. Yeah. Gilbert Minor Bond, you've made a career out of cars and quite successfully. Tell us about that. Where, when did it first start? What was your first car, first of all? Wow, my first car. My first you can car. be honest, because now I know you drive an uh, Shinde. I saw it at Black uh, one. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I drive a bit. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I drive any car that yeah. is convenient enough to, to get me to work. Okay. I almost don't own a car. Really? Yes. I just use a car that is practical to get me to work. All right. Uh, however, I advise on good cars yes. to people. Uh, where did my passion with cars start? I, I grew up in a garage somewhere in Aldred and uh, I admired uh, engines. Uh, of course, they have changed over the years. And uh, later in life, when I came out of advertising world, I worked for a battery company, and from the time I opened the engine to see where the battery sits, I loved the babies. And that I was love it. them up to today. Oh, excellent. Yes. Yes. yes, I believe car enthusiasts are born, and it's a permanent deal that you make. Now, buying your first car is obviously something that is big. It's quite important to note a few things before you walk into any dealership. Let's talk about buying your car in the 90s as opposed to 2013. What should people know about what has improved, what is better, easier, accessible? Mike? Um, a lot has changed. I mean, from the days of the 504 to the new cars today, technology has changed totally. It's not the same thing. Where you had um, carburetor engines, now you've got fuel injection. You've got common rail diesel. Cars are more efficient. Uh, there is this notion that your car is safer if it's heavier and harder. So the harder the metal, the safer the car is. Yes. That's not true. Okay. So cars are safer and they're lighter. When they're lighter, they're more efficient. The engines can take a lot of strain as opposed to engines from back in the day. Right. So there's improvement all the time and cars are getting better and better. Nobody actually manufactures a bad car anymore. Okay. Unless a few special people from some special places <laughs> right. who want to make money on disposable take cars. Take advantage. Yes. Yeah. But cars are generally much, much better now. Okay. And uh, you don't need to keep your car for 20 years to get real value from it. You should use it two, three, four, five years, get a new car, move on with your life right. efficiently without it costing you too much to run. Okay, Gilbert, come in on this. Uh, new versus used, uh, right? I just uh, want to add on uh, what yeah, Mike is sure. saying. Yeah, for sure. Go um, for it, yeah. Cars have, like he says, have really changed. But uh, there's some other changes that have taken place in cars that uh, have become very vital in our industry. Um, uh, initially in the 90s, people drove vehicles with, uh, which were manual, which had no power windows, which had no AC. It was normal to go to the main <laughs> dealers and uh, you buy a brand new car and there was no AC on it. Right. AC was an added advantage. So today, even the commercial vehicles 
uh, the big trucks we see moving from Mombasa to Nairobi are automatic. Right. Um, they have air conditioning. Some of them have got all the state of work entertainment inside. So it's really, cars are now fashionable with times. Right. So you can't, uh, like Moise says, keep a car for too long. You have to keep on changing with times. Okay. Yes. Now, um, the things to note when buying your first car. There are certain rules and do's and don'ts, okay? We'll go through that for you and tell you what the essential ones are. So, Mike, maybe you can start. Let's talk about um, the condition and, and actually let's start with the documents, which is the most important. You obviously have to have a license to operate a vehicle. That's the first thing. Then? Um, in terms of checking a car and making sure it's right, it depends whether you're buying used or you're buying new. If you're buying used, he'll talk about what you need. If you're buying new, it's in the showroom, it's safe. First of all, you need a driving license. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to drive a car. Yes. One of the key things you're buying a 4x4 is to be able to drive a 4x4 because a lot of people walk into a showroom and drive out with a 4x4 and they've never driven a 4x4 before. You've had people rolling in their Prados and all other sorts of uh, 4x4s because they jump from a saloon car into a 4x4 and take the corners as if it's the same. Mm -hmm. So you must know how to drive the vehicle you're taking. Right. But more importantly, you must know what kind of vehicle is ideal for you. I, one of the questions I get from a lot of people is, which is the best car? Okay. There's no such thing as the best car. Exactly. For everyone. So my fan cargo is okay. <laughs> Your fan cargo is another story altogether. It all depends on uh, mm -hmm. how much fun you like people to make of you. It also depends on how fun loving you are. Yes. Uh, because as you know, a fan cargo is basically a, a, a Vitz dressed ah. for a cocktail. Mike, we'll talk about that story after. Now, yeah. <laughs> really, fan cargo is dressed, is a fancier Vitz. Yeah, it's, it's just a vitz that's been dressed up a little. Okay. Yeah, but it's the same thing altogether. All right. So the thing to consider before buying a new car is what are you going to do with the car? What's your status? Are you single? Do yes. you have a family? How old are your kids? Mm -hmm. How long are their legs if they're sitting in the back? Would the car be practical for you and your needs today? Okay. If you're thinking about uh, a car that is basically from A to B in town, mm -hmm. how far is your office from your home? How will you use that car in your day? It must fit into your life rather than you fitting into its life. Okay. Yeah. Now we have um, on the screen there the documents that you need. Of course, you need a logbook, right? Gilbert, maybe you can come in on this. Pre-inspection documents. There are a couple of documents that one needs, right? Take us through that, please. Okay. Um, what do I expect? What does a client expect when, or a buyer expect? The first, you're saying you're talking about the first-time owner, maybe a lady or a man. What do they expect, or what are they looking for when they come to look for a vehicle? Uh, very important areas, for, first of all, is shopping around and understanding what kind of vehicle you're looking at. Like Mike says, uh, I'm looking, it's my, I've got a fast job, probably I live in, uh, uh, most people get their fast jobs probably earning an average of 150, 200,000 or 100,000. Probably you prob you've been living about 10 kilometers within the radius of Nairobi. So right. you, it, it must fit into your pocket. It must also fit into your uh, into your daily activities, like you're saying. So bef then when you get to that level, then you identify what brand do I want? Do I want a Toyota? Do I want a Nissan? Do I want uh, uh, another different model? Then based on that, you also have to look into little tools like, uh, because it's my first car, I need to change it after two years after I'm comfortable, yes. right? Yeah. So uh, do I buy a car which is a tool of work or which is a tool of work and an asset at the same time, so that in two years' time, I'll be able to sell the vehicle yes. and be able to quickly buy another one that suits my, 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 my pocket better and my day-to-day -day life better. Then you come to the documents after you decided that. Mm -hmm. With, uh, very important documents is uh, uh, things like bill of lending. You need to know where the car came from because some countries, uh, like Mike will tell you in his write-up, some countries, Cars may not be as clean as you expect. Okay. They may have a few issues. Then you look at uh, the inspection papers. And inspection is very important because, you know, last year, is it last year but one, Mike, we had the tsunami in the Japan? Yes. Mm -hmm. So they have now introduced tests of radiation. It's very important because uh, if you have cancer, you're not going to last from, uh, at, if, you, if you get contaminated, a long way. I don't think it's going to last 100 days. You're specifically uh, talking about cars that were. Yeah, now they have radiation, so you must ensure that there's radiation okay. now. 
you must ensure there is an inspected car mileage. But and how do not. I ensure that? I'm, I'm, I'm a first-time buyer. I have no clue about radiation, where the car has come from. If I walk into a dealership, how do I ensure that maybe JVEC has actually, you know, ensured the, that? Is it just documentation? There are documents to that, and you can also log into uh, Kenya Bureau of Standard to confirm the inspection. Okay. You can log into Kenya, Kenya Revenue Authority to confirm the documents are, are correct. And, uh, or you can do physical search at uh, most of these institutions. They have all that information available. Okay. Then after that, you bring in your mechanic. Uh, before you bring in your mechanic, first of all, uh, you've, you have identified the vehicle. Bring in your mechanic or your expert to advise you on the vehicle. Mm -hmm. If the car you feel is cleaner, doesn't need a mechanic, at least ask an opinion from your friends. And then do a road test. Most uh, car dealers have got what they call Kenya Garage Plate which has got insurance. So if the car doesn't got, uh, have insurance, you actually can do a test drive, but don't do it for fun to make fun of them. Just test the car that you buy. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mikey, I come in on that, on, on the condition uh, of the vehicle, which is key before buying it. And what we're seeing obviously is when you're a first time buyer, it, uh, very rarely will you get a brand new vehicle. You probably yeah. always go for a second hand. How do you, you're a young lady, you've saved up, you know, you're on your first job. How do you even know what to check when it comes to condition? He suggested the mechanic. What if you don't have that option? If you don't have the option of a mechanic, which is very hard because there are lots of mechanics, yes. you could call me. <laughs> well, okay. I may not be available for everyone. Right. Yeah. But what I suggest is spare some time. Don't rush through it. And testing a car is a little more than just going and kicking the tires and driving around the block. You won't tell whether it overheats whether it has a bad consumption. And with the new cars today, you can tell how it's consuming. I recommend you take the car down the road and run it until it's hot. Okay. 10, 20, 30 kilometers, do it. Down Mombasa Road all the way to Mulolongo, even further and back. By the time you get back, you will know if the car has issues. Okay. Key issues to look out for is vibrations. Is the suspension all messed up? Because that means you have to buy a whole new set of uh, tie rods and shocks and everything else, which can cost you quite quite a bit, okay. depending on the model. Heating. All these cars from Europe and everywhere else, it's not as hot as it is here. So the rated, it could be smaller, it could have issues regarding temperature. Okay. So chances are within six months to one year, that car will be overheating, you'll be changing gasket, you'll be changing all sorts of things. If you're okay with that, you just need to know how much they cost. A key thing to do, like uh, the gentleman said earlier, is research. Find out what would it cost to replace the entire suspension of your car. God forbid, if it happens, you need to do it within the one year. Right. What would that cost you? Factor that into your cost. Service. European cars, service could be anything from 15,000 to 40,000, depending on how many cylinders the engine has. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for that? Do you know what it costs at Bavaria or DTW, wherever it is? Yes. Uh, do we have support in terms of diagnostics to check that the car can be run with the right software and all the errors can be corrected? Because the cars out there are not necessarily available in Kenya. So you might have a car like a Mark X, and everything is in Japanese. Yes. And a friend of mine asking me, how do I translate this to English? Exactly. To him, I mean, you have the wrong car. It's for the wrong market. You're stuck. You either learn Japanese or get another vehicle. Okay. In, in regards to buying a good, clean car, I recommend, a lot of people want to go online and just buy cars from places they're not sure of. <laughs> yeah. I recommend get to talk to gentlemen like Mina and just get them to choose the car and pick it for you. Okay. Then you're sure. And they could give you a warranty of six months or 12 months, depending on how genuine they are. Okay, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And, of course, I want to know about buying from a regular individual seller versus a dealership. But I believe we have John on the line. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine, John. JJ, how are you? I'm okay. Do you have uh, a question or a comment? Yeah. I just want to ask a question. Go for it. Uh, I've happened to be in an instance... Mm -hmm. uh, where I saw, um, I decided to go to make a purchase on a vehicle, but it was through an advert uh, via one of the uh, publications. So I ended up taking my due diligence, whereby I went to KRA and did a search, and it turned out like the search, uh, based on the logbook, was actually corresponding to the actual logbook that the seller had. But eventually, after a day or two, it ended up like I was conned out. I'd bought a vehicle from uh, this guy, but a few days later, someone else uh, turns out and claims that the vehicle is his. 
on such instances when I end up doing my due diligence uh, and I end up losing. It was almost close to 800,000 shillings. So how do we get to work on such instances where me as a person, I do my due diligence, go to KRA, get the relevant information, and everything aligns to the actual logbook that had been shown to me, but a few days later, it ends up like I've been conned. Thank you, John, for that comment. So did they, did, did he end up with the car? Is he still on the line? Yeah, I'm still on the line. Did you still end up, did you end up with a car? A few days later, did, did, you, did they have to repossess the car from you, even after uh, you bought it? Basically, what happened, the guy who actually sold me the vehicle uh, went, uh, went offline eh, after a day or two. Mm -hmm. But uh, some other guy came to my house. In fact, he actually traced the vehicle to where I live. And he came on a Saturday morning after three or four days claiming that the vehicle was his. We drove to the nearest police station and the vehicle was impounded. Uh, on the same day, the guy went and brought a logbook to show that he actually owns the vehicle. So when I, uh, when I, um, I made my attempt on trying to reach the guy who actually sold me the vehicle, but his, for the number had gone actually off. Okay. So later it ended up like, since the guy claimed that like he... Uh, had, sorry, this new guy who said like he actually owns the vehicle ended up repossessing the vehicle from me and I ended up losing. Okay. Um, yeah. Gilbert is asking, uh, how did you actually purchase the vehicle? Uh, it was, okay, uh, I, I paid for it in cash. Okay. But it was through an advert that we see on the daily papers. All right. Okay, John. Yeah. Thank you. I'll try and get you an answer right here. John represents a lot of Kenyans who've gone through the same thing. Logbook clears, the check clears, it takes the steps that we're talking about here, but still, somebody showed up a couple of days later with a legitimate logbook, 800,000 cash, a lot of money. Gilbert, come in mm. on this. There they exist a, a lot of con men in our industry. It's a big industry. Because that sounds truly yeah, like yeah, the yeah, yeah, typical yeah. con story. Yeah. yeah, I recently handled a very difficult case. Um, a good client, a good customer walks into the showroom, buys a genuine car with the logbook and everything, and we sold him the car. But a couple of weeks before that, some lady had come to the showroom, this is how the conning game goes, had come to the showroom and identified that particular car. She didn't do a road test, she said this is the car I want, give me a, a copy of the logbook, I'll go to my financial and have the finance done. I'll not name the financial. And they went and did the search. They got the PIN certificate of the original importer and the ID of the original importer because we were selling the car on behalf. And uh, they uh, went and applied and claimed they had lost the logbook. So they did a complete duplicate, which is got the same same number, everything yeah. at Kenya Revenue Authority. It, it is possible to get a brand new logbook that matches yeah. another one. Yeah, yeah because you, you, need, you need to, that's, that's where the, now the, C, the CID uh, inspection department needs to come in and uh, when verify completely that you are the original owner. But these people are very clever. They even changed the ID, they even removed the ID photo of that particular person. Wow. And put their own photo. Is this an inside job? Then can we say, and especially no, maybe in the in it, the case of John, the ID was done outside, maybe somewhere on on Kirinyaga Road where they do them, or yeah. somewhere maybe they did it somewhere because the w the only document that we were able to identify was different from okay from this in, in this incident was the ID. But the, the most interesting thing is that the finance company gave money, ah. and the car was done tracking. So what, what, what of uh, John's case, the, for example, what can he I, I just do? wanted to clear this mm -hmm. so that he understands. Because people went to his house to get a car. Mm -hmm. This lady came with a logbook. She paid for valuation mm -hmm. and sent somebody to, to install uh, a tracking device. Yeah. So when we finally sold the car, we told her, uh, we, we tried to track her to come and remove. She was not online, but there was somebody from a finance institution saying, I want, we want our car. This lady is defaulting. Do you understand the two? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I believe that we have another caller who's been holding. Good morning. Hello. Hi, Kobe. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Patrick, you have a question or a comment? Yes, I have a question. My name is Patrick. Okay. Go for it. 
Yeah, my, my, my question is uh, on the importation of uh, vehicles, when you're importing a vehicle. Yeah. The, the, do you have, uh, like, some vehicles are meant uh, for uh, cold countries? Like yes. those countries with, uh, uh, with snow and such things. So when you import that vehicle to Kenya, it's used to a cold country. It's a used car and you import it. So what, what is your opinion on imported vehicles from those cold countries and, and, what, and what is the advice on that car coming to Kenya and the function of that car in Kenya? Okay, thank you for that, Patrick. Very good All question. Right. Mike, you can come in on that. Um, Patrick, that's a good question. What happens when cars are manufactured? The manufacturers design those cars to work in any country. So they're designed and tested in all temperatures, ice, deserts, all sorts of temperatures, and they're put into rooms that are temperature can be controlled. So all cars can work in any place, but they're customized for specific markets when they're sold. So a car in Europe in a cold temperature area will have a smaller radiator and everything else will be based on what they need there. If something has come to a tropicalized country, then they have to consider heat, dust, and all those issues, which is why we recommend if you're buying a used car, it's always good to buy a car that was meant for this region. It's local used. Or if you bring it in, take it to the dealer and get them to tweak a few things for you, which won't be much, apart from the suspension. But in terms of heating, there could be issues, depending on how fast you drive, how often you drive, how consistently the engine is on. Okay. So you need to be careful with that. Okay, uh, we'll go through a couple of steps before we run out of time, obviously, of what you should note uh, when buying your car. Um, some of the things that you should obviously know is the test driving part. And for me, what I'd like to define here is a private seller versus a dealership. Talk to us about that. What are the disadvantages and advantages from buying from, you know, an individual owner versus going into a, an authorized dealer? Um, You're a dealer, they, so obviously you want people uh, to come to you. We, <laughs> but we, we want people to come to us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there are some of us, uh, like in every industry, there are, there are people who are not, uh, who don't understand the market. They're in there for money, uh, and that's it. Uh, we are also in there for money, but the money must be right and the, the advice must be right. So when you're buying, when, when you're buying a vehicle from us, what, uh, what exactly are you looking? You're looking for a car which is practical. Yes. And uh, apart from looking for a car which is practical, you're looking for a vehicle that will serve your, 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 your like we said earlier, that will serve you in the right way, that you can be able to get parts availability throughout. So if you, the vast is, the, the thing is that we are going to advise you on, a, on, on the vehicle in terms of how it will serve you, where you can get parts, all availability. The guy who is selling you as an individual is there for money. So he can bring you any kind of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, he will not have much knowledge because he's out there to make a shilling. And that's what has happened. The current, current trim, the market has got a lot of individual importers. And you see this guy found a car, the, the guy who talked to us earlier found a car in the newspaper. And we quickly bought for it cash. But what, look at what happened. The dealership will be there five okay. years, ten years, this individual will only be with you that particular time. Tomorrow will be with somebody else. So we must know what to do. What to do. Mike, my, before air? My advice would be, well, there's the dealers and there's individual dealers. Yes. But when I think of individual, I'm thinking about a personal. You're buying a car from me. I own the car. I'm selling it to you as a personal, person to person deal. Yeah. Chances are you'll, I'll give you the records. I'll be as genuine as possible and you can test the car. And chances of things going wrong are not as bad as if you're dealing with People are just in it for the profiteering, okay. for profits. But beyond that, look for a car that works for you. And if you are hoping to be a dealer, you know, some people buy cars to sell. Yes. I want to drive this car for a year and then sell it, and I want to get back my money. That's the wrong reason to buy a car, because mm -hmm. you're not in the market of buying and selling cars. So buy a car that works for you. Okay. Buy the right color. If you buy a pink car, it might be very difficult to sell it. Yes. So your second best, of course, is a Toyota, because Kenyans believe Toyota is everything. Yeah. <laughs> which is... Debatable. Which brings me to my next point before we leave you. Mike is going to take us through luxury versus reality, right? And we have a couple of pictures that we'll play for you and maybe you can take us through because I think everybody aspires to drive the Range Rovers and the Mercedes and the Benz, but the reality is not always so. That's a Porsche Cayenne. Porsche Cayenne, beautiful car. If you remove all the metal, it's a Touareg. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay? Really? So, exactly. It you're is paying extra. For a lot of good other things, better material on the inside, but you're basically buying a, a Touareg in a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> now there you have a souped-up X6. X6, yeah. beautiful car. 
you need to have painkillers because every time you get into the car, you'll knock your head because the roof line is very low. Really? So you're better off buying an X X5. Okay. So let's be practical. It's a nice car, beautiful. If you've got ego issues, it's the best car for you because it makes you look like you're very, very successful. You Gilbert, are you Again. selling a lot of these? Are you selling a lot of the X, uh, BMWs, they are Porsches? They're not very fast movers. They're not fast movers because they're also not cheap. They're not, okay. uh, so they have particular How much people. does a Porsche go for right now in Kenya? Uh, which one? The new a ship? Porsche Cayenne. The, the, we don't have the new ship people driving the new ship yet. Uh, the one you're showing there is, uh, I believe, 2012, 2011. Okay. How much would that one go for, for about, example? About 12 million. 12 million. 12 million to 14 million. I'll buy a small country instead. Mike, which what's next so in, in terms of, this is, this is the latest one. And yeah. then there's Audi. I love this car. This is a beautiful car as well. A lot of people have tears about it because they bring them in, turbo diesel, all sorts of issues, the turbos and sensors going crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry for that, guys, but it's a choice you made. What does that mean when you say that it's a, turbo is a problem? Um, the... Um, the, the Audi is, uh, Mike will expound on this because you're an expert in that line, is made to uh, be a much quicker, much powerful vehicle. So they, they add a little bit more extras, and those extras are, tend to be the problem mm -hmm. in the end. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you really look clearly into it, is that you're better off with a, tour, uh, with a Touareg, which is common in the local market. The thing, the thing to consider, under the skin, all these cars are the same. The Touareg, the Porsche, a lot of the mechanicals okay. are the same. So, okay. it's a now, chance. Now, these are the smaller cars? This, these, these this are is for a perfect uh, executive, uh, middle level management. You're looking for a car that fits into your profile. Because yeah. a car is an extension of you. Mm -hmm. Be sure that you buy a car that befits who you are and who you'd like people to think you are, perhaps. Okay. And this works well. It's an executive cruiser. It's not as expensive to run. Affordability? They are very cheap. I mean, cheap. Oh, yeah. Benz. A yeah. used, a used Benz is same price as a Toyota Corolla. Uh, no way. No, uh, well, which, some form of uh, the early on. It, it will depend. It depends on, on the spec. Is, on the spec. One point four, one point five. A, is, is, okay. If it's an E three, if it's an E. The C class especially. Is a C class. Uh, okay. Right now, it's six point five. Maybe. Okay. Out of your pocket. Yeah. We've run out of time, and I think that we could talk about this all day. We'll bring you guys back. We must. Love I think it is like. essential. We have so much more to talk about. Yeah. But. Your parting words for that young lady, young man who, you know, has been jabbing and is now ready, can talk to the bank and is ready to buy a car. Gilbert? Can I expound? Right now, um, most people want to buy. The young lady who's just come in and uh, has a reasonable budget, the car they're buying, they used to buy initially was Vitz, IST, and uh, Ranex uh, and uh, Alex. But right now, because the prices in cars, in second-hand vehicles or pre-owned vehicles have been going up all over the world, they, these are new, they are new models, like Mike says. You don't have always to be stuck with a Toyota. You can go for Mazda Demio. It's a good car. There's Honda Fit. There's, uh, there's uh, another, some other little car, mm -hmm. other small cars, which are okay. making more sense. But buy a vehicle that is practical. Buy a vehicle that you can be able to maintain easily, like Mike says. Buy a vehicle that is also a tool uh, of, of, uh, of work and an asset at the same time. Mike, your parting words? My parting shot would be buy a vehicle that fits your personality. If you drive a lot at night, if you like your tipple, then you buy a safe car. Because chances of you having a crash are high. Right. So be sure that it has enough airbags to cushion you. Okay. Also, buy one that fits with your neighborhood. So that you, 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 you blend in well. <laughs> and it fits your job as well. Right. Yeah. Just, don't just buy any vehicle. Yeah. If you want people to make fun of you, buy a fun cargo. Aye. If you want to drive below 60 <laughs> kilometers an hour, buy a VIT. There's some vehicles you should not drive beyond That's 60 kilometers an hour. That's what I could afford then. So don't go beyond 60 kilometers an hour. Don't make fun the, of my fun cargo, Mike. The, the, it's a beautiful car. Thank it you. works. Mike, the traffic jam is so much, uh, I don't even think the, <laughs> All right, all right, here we go. The guzzlers are going to be fast. They, they're so you guys much stay. Traffic. This conversation will yeah. continue. <laughs> all right. This conversation is obviously going to continue on line you have any questions from Mike and Gilbert at AM Live is where we are and of course Facebook AM Live NTV is where you can come in okay for now we will just try to make you laugh as I ask Mike why is making fun of my car here's the tube